Welcome in to this Sunday edition of Longhorn Livestream. My name is Jerry Hamilton, joined by two smarter people than I, Bobby Burton and Rod Babers. Uh, big show tonight. We're uh, going to be talking, obviously, Texas football. Spring practice will be – they'll be back on the field Tuesday. They had what I was told today was a very live practice on Friday, a physical live spring practice on Friday headed in. Uh, to Easter weekend. Happy Easter to everybody out there. Uh, we'll also uh, probably, we're scheduled to have a guest. We're not going to say who that is. Scheduled to have a guest about 7.30. Uh, it'll be a really good guest with a lot of knowledge. Uh, I'm very excited about this one. Uh, big. T I want to say this, guys. Uh, first of all, the uh, Longhorn live stream is sponsored by Joe Brown. Uh, there you see Joe Brown, veteran veteran mortgage broker. Give him a call, 512-663-4744. But I wanted to give a big shout out to Vic Schaefer for mm -hmm. doing a hell of a coaching job this year. Yeah. You know, if you wondered if you were going to run into a game where the loss of Rory Harmon was going to be felt, that game was today. The quickness of the NC State guards, uh, the lefty was actually shooting the lights out the last two games. Oh. She's a tremendous player. But that team had a lot of quickness at guard. They had multiple guards who could put the ball on the floor and attack you into the paint, create straight line driving angles. Uh, so that was a tough matchup for Texas today. Uh, they didn't shoot enough threes. They didn't hit enough threes. I think they had one for the game, maybe two. Uh, but so NC State played better today. They deserved to be in the final four. But hell of a season. Great, great coaching job to Vic Schaefer, getting this team to an elite eight. I, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care where they're ranked, what their seed was when the tournament started, what the expectations were. You lose your probably third-team All-American point guard 12 games into the season, and not many people would have bet Texas would have been there. And I'm so interested to see how Madison Booker's game evolves next year and develops. I think the three-point shot uh, is going to be a big key for her moving forward as she finishes her next two, three years at Texas and on into the WNBA. But a lot going on, a lot of recruiting stuff uh, as well, guys. Um, Bobby, I'll, I'll let you get started. Friday, we heard it was a live physical practice. I mean, to me, not surprised. I think there were some high school coaches there that were surprised. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I mean, Texas didn't didn't shy away from it, apparently, on Friday. I'm told that Cedric Baxter, uh, running back uh, out of Orlando's Edgewater, looked really, really good in practice. Quicker uh, decision maker right now, understands the blocking schemes a little bit better, and pass protection, and is attacking uh, right now as well. Heard he had a really, really uh, good practice. To your point, Jerry, though, physical was a word that came up as well. Uh, the Longhorns now, this is the second week. It started last Saturday when they went into pads. They've carried that over through Friday of this past week. Uh, so now they're sitting there having four padded practices in, six altogether. Uh, Tuesday, as you mentioned, Jerry, will be practice number seven. Uh, the Longhorns uh, sneakily are now three weeks in to spring ball. It's a five-week spring ball schedule culminating on April 20th. Uh, on the 20th will be the spring game at 1 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Uh, so, look, we've got a lot of stuff going on right now. Uh, practice is one of them. Uh, you mentioned the women's basketball team. What a valiant effort there. They just got – at one point, that uh, Elijah uh, – Aaliyah James – was five or six or six or seven from three point land. She was unconscious yep. basically. And then uh baseball team one also uh, two of three from Kansas state. I thought that was important uh, to stay in the thick of the uh, big 12 race. I actually think they're leading the big 12 yep. race, uh, which is good stuff. Uh, but a lot of stuff going on on the 40 uh, all around uh, and recruiting could be starting to heat up too, because this is the big week, Jerry, the first yeah. week, uh, where we're really going to see some extended visitors. Uh, Josiah Sharma was in, of course, this past weekend, as well as some younger players that were in as well. Uh, but it uh, looks like to me, Texas is getting ready to, to heat up the recruiting trail. Hey, Rod, uh, I want to go to you uh, before we get uh, uh, some more on Joe Brown from Bobby Burton. Um, Bobby put out a movers list on ontexasfootball.com, some guys mm -hmm. that are kind of on the move, ascending, stock up, whatever you want to call it this spring. And one of those guys mentioned was Gavin Holmes. So I want to talk about what you saw from Gavin Holmes last year. And two, if he is a more physical player this year, which some of the earlier reports are saying that, what does that do for his game in your eyes? 
his body's changed a little bit from what I've seen uh, this year. Um, I think he's a little bit more rocked up. I think he seems like he's a little bit more cut up. I, I spoke to him, actually. Uh, shout out to my man, Nick Shirley, third and Longhorn uh, podcast, which is great. Uh, you know, Derek Johnson and my man, Alex Okafor and uh, Jeremy Hills and Fozzie Whitaker. Those guys are awesome. Uh, and one of the conversations I had with Gavin Holmes, uh, you know, was about, and I want to get too deep into the weeds, but I just talked to him about man coverage and, yeah. And he said that he actually wants to start. He wants to play more bump and run coverage. He wants to play more press man. Um, I think one of the reasons he transformed his body is for that. Uh, and that's so you can make your you can make your shots matter at the line of scrimmage. You only get a couple of shots on receivers to redirect them. You want to make them matter. Uh, and part of that is being powerful with your punch, uh, being powerful with you know the your ability to redirect the guy. If you want to get two hands on him. So I think it's interesting that he transformed his body. And he's a guy that he, he he considers himself to be. A, a, a premier man coverage defender. Uh, Texas wants to play more man coverage, so it'll be interesting to see this season if we, uh, along with those guys playing more press like they did toward the end of the season last season, if, you know, Gavin Holmes, if he separates a little bit from the other guys, if, you know, that's what they're doing more of, if he shows that he's a better press cover guy than some of his other teammates. I think Malik Muhammad, that's a strength with him. Uh, for Terrence Brooks, it'll be interesting. I think Terrence Brooks can pretty much do anything, um, but I'd like to see him get his hands on guys at the line of scrimmage. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the coaches are going to emphasize. They're going to emphasize redirecting guys. They're going to emphasize leverage. Are we going to emphasize being physical at the line of scrimmage? If that's the case, then maybe Gavin Holmes can get some more reps if he can prove that, hey, man, now I'm actually a, a, you know, a high level. I'm one of the better press coverage corners on this team. And right now, I don't know if we know who the best – press cover corner on the team is my guess would be it's Malik Muhammad. Um, but you know that, like I said, I, I'm not watching the guys every day in practice, but my guess it would be him last year leading up. I would have said it was him. Um, and I probably went, went, you know, Ryan Watts, uh, right after that, then a Terrence Brooks and then Gavin Holmes after that. So we'll see. Ryan Watts was great at the line of scrimmage, but then downfield at times he would struggle getting in out of breaks, but I will say this, his combine numbers and testing numbers, it it really did it it defied and actually didn't align with what you watched on film. That's why he's such an interesting prospect, I think, for some teams out there because his drill showed he did have short area quickness that he could get in and out of breaks really quickly, but he didn't do that on film all the time. So I don't know if it was something with his eyes or something with just the the technique period. But either way, um, I think that's going to be what separates the corners this year. Who can play press man and who can the coaches trust out there playing press man because they definitely want to do more of it. Uh, hey, Rod, uh, wait one second, Jerry. I had a question for Rod. Gavin Holmes is the fastest corner out there. Okay. You know he's got long arms. You think that, you know, if last year I was told that he just didn't play as physical as they wanted. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so you're saying, talking about his body changing, et cetera, you know, is this a chance where he actually might, I, I think he's in line now for more snaps, just bottom line is what it sounds like to me. It's interesting you said he's the fastest corner. If that's the case, then maybe that's part of the reason that, you know, he's not at the line of scrimmage being more patient, trying to redirect guys, almost over-reliant on his speed. I was a fast guy too. So I actually can, I can really identify with that. There are times I was lazy a little bit at the line of scrimmage, especially when I knew I could run with a guy because it is easy just to make it a track meet and run with a guy rather than because at the line of scrimmage at times, if you have bad technique, bad fundamentals, it can actually you know put you at a disadvantage um, rather than just, you know, turning your hips and running because you feel really confident in your ability to run with them downfield. So I think for him, maybe you're right about that. Maybe I mean, I didn't know he was actually the fastest corner. That makes a lot of sense. So if you can combine that, though with the ability to be patient at the line of scrimmage and deliver a punch and have great leverage and be able to be in phase with wide receivers. You know, like I said, you said maybe he's in line to get more snaps. That could be it. I mean, that, that maybe that's what they brought him here for initially. And now that they want to do more of that, that'll be right in his wheelhouse. I, I know Sark's on a record for saying they want to play more press, man. Um, and Nick Saban has said that that is the, in his opinion, that is the best coverage and technique that you can play on defense. Problem is, everybody can't do it. Everybody ain't got the dogs to do it. Everybody ain't got the athletes to do it. Texas is one of the few teams that has that luxury. Hey, Bobby, before uh, you tell everybody about Joe Brown, a question from AJJ, AJJ Sports so we're, we're going to think about. Who is the best wide receiver Texas will face this season? We'll give everybody some time to think about that, yep. the chat yep. included, while you tell us more about Joe Brown. 
Yeah, I got to think about that myself. I don't have to think very long about Joe Brown. I've known Joe Brown for more than 25 years. He actually helped me buy my first house. Uh, he's a mortgage broker, a veteran mortgage professional. I've been doing it for more than three decades. Uh, in fact, uh, he has also helped not just me, but a number of Longhorns through, through the years. He's got two degrees uh, and has worked with various UT athletes as well. Uh, he is just one of a kind, a great guy. He's also a proud Navy veteran. Uh, Joe is a devout Longhorn. Give him a call if you're thinking about what, what would be maybe one of the most biggest decisions of your life uh, from a financial perspective, and that's your mortgage. Give him a call if you want to feel safe and secure and have somebody that's been there and done that for 30 plus years. 512-663-4744. That's 512-663-4744. Uh, thank you, Brown, for your sponsorship of the Sunday night live stream. Hook them. All right, so best receiver Texas will face this year on the schedule. That's good. Uh, Luther Burden has been brought up, unless Texas they, plays Missouri. They don't. Uh, I think Barry and Brown may be the most talented, but I'm not sure he's actually going to be the best. You know, Barry and Brown is a little bit bigger Isaiah Bond. You know, Barry and Brown, actually, if you were doing a, a mock draft right now, he would go ahead of Isaiah Bond. Yeah, uh, to give you a feel for that, uh, I don't think A and M has anybody. Michigan, they don't have anybody that I would say would go uh, particularly high. Um, Georgia, good. maybe uh, is Lovett back? Jerry Dominic I Lovett, I think he's back. Uh, the he's other, back one, the other one, Nick Anderson is going to be very good at OU this year. Head into year three, um, he's going to be a tough matchup. Um, but uh, yeah, some Randy Ether said, I know we don't play him. I hey, ordered SEC title game. He's talking about Luther Burden, but I really think Barry and Brown is the most talented and gifted guy Texas will face because he's also a tremendous kickoff return guy. I mean, he can, yeah. he's a momentum changer. Uh, so he's probably at the top of the list for me. Um, when you look right, I'll say this the sophomore to be Eugene Wilson at Florida is going to be the best slot type receiver Texas faces. He's an under-the-radar guy because Florida had a bad year on the field again. But I'm telling you, I saw Eugene Wilson at Under Armour camp in Miami in high school, and, and I'm calling him a poor man's Jalen Waddle, and that's very much a compliment Ooh. to him. He may not have quite as much lateral, just quickness to explosive top end like Waddle did, but I'm telling you, Eugene Wilson is a tremendous slot receiver. Uh, those are the two I think that are uh, – is is going to be the toughest. The, 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 hey, Jerry, uh, go ahead, Rod. No, I just want to say real quick, the best receivers they'll face, honestly, a good chance of it, are in practice every day. That's and that's the whole practice. point. That's, yep. the, that's, that's the entire point of it all, is that if those DBs should be ready to go because they should face bigger challenges in practice. Actually, the last two years, the last two years, they should have seen bigger challenges in practice than they'll see in their first year in the SEC. I expect them to – you know, play at a really high level against that against opponents because in practice they're going to see the best wide receivers potentially. Uh, no, in the SEC, who knows? Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody asked about Jalen Hale. I think Jalen Hale just got injured at Bama. By the way, uh, but somebody brought up Ryan Williams. Ryan Williams is going to be fascinating to me. The freshman five star that graduated Sarah Land early, reclassed to twenty four. When I tell you he's skinny now, I mean he is. When he went to Alabama now, if he was 160 pounds, I mean, it was Xavier worthy look to him. <laughs> so how much is he going to be able to handle as a freshman there? Uh, and I think he's he could be a first round pick one day. I haven't seen him in person plus the tape. He's extremely gifted. Um, but how much is how much physically is he going to be able to uh, take on next year? Because he's going to be awfully dangerous in Kalen DeBoer's scheme. Uh, and how much strength can they add to him? Not having s spring track going ahead and enrolling at Bama, I think, is really going to help Ryan Williams' physical development. Um, KV Keith Williams asked about Khalil Jackson from Florida. I, I I think Eugene Wilson's the guy at Florida that scares me the most. That's just me. I think Eugene Wilson's tremendous. I, 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 I could be, I could be on, on board with that. I really could. Yeah, I mean, here's so, they uh, don't play – I was thinking about Trey Harris at Ole Miss, but Texas doesn't play Trey Harris. And Antoine Wells, if he's uh, healthy at Ole Miss, Texas isn't going to play those guys in the regular season. Arkansas, 
A&M, Oklahoma. I mean, you kind of go down the list, Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, Michigan. I mean, um, I, I really uh, I, I really think we're going to be talking about Barry and Brown and watch out for Eugene Wilson uh, because Eugene mm-hmm. Wilson, I think Graham Mertz, it, it, one of his Graham Mertz's strength is going to be getting Eugene Wilson the ball. Uh, it, I'm not sure Graham Mertz is the answer for Florida, but I think there's going to be some consistency there with Eugene Wilson. He had a big freshman year that nobody really talked about. Uh, Victor Santiago, best coach in the SEC. Hmm. Well, That's an interesting question. Um, Kirby I mean, is, Kirby's got to be at the top, right? Is there I mean, one out there that's won a national championship? We don't Other think than Kirby, Kirby Smart? Kirby's the think? guy, right? Kirby's the top of the list. Kirby's the top guy because he's won two and he has yeah. a handful of rings from being at Bama. So, yeah. I mean, he's got more than – he may have six national championship rings at this point. So, I, I think he has five for sure. Um, so, Kirby's number one uh, on that list right now. Um, I think Kalen DeBoer is coaching a national championship game. He, I mean, he's won at every level. He's probably your number two guy. Um, then you get to Brian Kelly, who's coached in multiple college football playoffs, right? Then you got yeah. Sarkeesian um, that's entered the entered the uh, talk, having been at a college football playoff last year. Okay. Then you get to uh, the rest of the league. I mean, Lane Kiffin, this is his chance to join that group, right? This is his year. Ole Miss has put a ton into this season, by the way, from an NIL portal perspective. They're saying 12-team playoff. we got third-year starting quarterback. Here's three really good offensive linemen, Coach Kiffin. Mix them in. Uh, here's some good D linemen from inside the conference that transferred that way. Ole Miss has a really shot this year. Um, you know, then you have a lot of coaches in this league, to me, guys, Josh Heupel, that are trying to climb that list right Drink now. Right? Drink Drinkwitz is on that list. I like Drinkwitz. Drinkwitz is a very good football coach. Yeah, he's a good coach, man. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but yeah, Richard you. Walker's pointing out Kirby makes a lot of in-game mistakes. But, I mean, you could look at Texas and Washington and point out in-game mistakes, both coaches. I mean, so I think that's kind of – somebody's got to go. I mean, he's got two national championships as a coach. And, uh, look, I mean – I think it's, yes, Georgia's the top three talented program in the country, but Mark Rick could never get Georgia over the hump. So Kirby gets some points for that on some level. Yep. No, Sark can climb that list really after this season. He can get all the way up into the top three easily. Yep. If he just has a great season, gets to a national title game with Texas, he'd, all, he'd climb right into the top two or three in that league. Uh, but Kirby Smart's the big dog until somebody else wins a national title. That's There's just no- – no doubt yeah. about it. Um, yeah. All right, uh, we're, guys, we're t- it's time to be joined by a special guest, okay? This one excites me a lot. Let's bring in Coach Aaron De La Torre. He's the D coordinator at Denton Ryan High School. Coach, what's up, man? Thanks for joining the uh, Longhorn live stream with Bobby Burton, Rod Babers, and myself. I've been looking forward to being on for a while. Oh, we got – I don't hear his – I don't hear his uh, – It might be. You there, Coach? Oh, he may not be able to hear him right now. We may we may have to get us. I don't think I don't think we can hear him. Yeah, we'll get we'll get that squared away. Let's see, we'll get that squared away in a second. But Coach uh, DLT, I call him, is uh, is backstage. Uh, so a little bit of background here: Coach JT Sanders at Denton Ryan, Anthony Hill, obviously Austin Jordan, obviously. It goes ball, the father of Alex De La Torre, right, who played at Texas, uh, is coaching high school ball now, been a part of those Denton Ryan great teams, uh, we're very close to Mac Brown at Texas at that time. Uh, so hopefully we get him back with his uh, uh, with his audio because he's got so he's got great insight on all those guys I just named, DFW area in general. Um, you know, so well, well, hey, Bobby, take over. I need to send a text real quick. Yeah, let, let me see if I can uh, bring him back in real quick. Coach, are you there, oh, bud? There he is. There he is. Oh, we still can't hear him. Yeah. Still can't hear him. Coach, uh, Jerry's going to send you a text right now if you can hear us. Jerry's sending you a text. Yeah. Hey, uh, I, Rod, and, and yeah. I, I want to talk about this with Coach when he gets a, gets a chance to get on here. Um, my question, I guess, is if for, for anybody involved in high school football these days is how much the kids have changed. That's the eternal question. It was asked when I was a young kid. 
Oh, you know, Bobby, you don't remember what it was like 30 years ago. <laughs> well, here's the reality of it. He's been in this, he's been in the wars and in the trenches with guys. How much has it changed? That's that's going to be a good question for everybody because I, I remember specifically a high school coach of mine said, oh, things have changed in the last 20 years since I've been doing this. Well, now he's seen it, right? Um, yeah. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see what he has to say. I'll say they, they have changed, but they still also, a lot of them want the same things. They all want to play in the NFL. They all want to play for championships. And they all want to play with other great players. Nobody wants to play with a lot of scrubs. You know, I want to play with other good football players. So there's still some things that the, the guys 30, 40 years ago that, that the guys still have in common with the young teenagers today being recruited. They want to play, they all want to play in the league. If you can help them get there and they all want to, you know, everybody wants to play for championships. If you can promise them those two things, which Texas right now, they can deliver on, or at least they did last season and they can deliver on and they will in the upcoming draft. That's still something in the guys in the sixties and seventies and the guys in the 20, 2024, they still have the same thing in common. They all want to play in that league, man. That league is what they want. Yeah. Hey, AJJ Sports is bringing some questions tonight. Um, uh, people are asking a lot about recruiting announcements. Far beware of April hey, Fool's Day. Hey. By the way, beware of April Fool's Day on some things. But uh, see <laughs> Coach Matt. can you hear me? We yeah. got you there. Hey, let's go. <laughs> uh, hey, so, Coach. Uh, by the way, thank you very much for joining us. We've we've been trying to get Coach on for a, a while. Of, of course, they're in the playoffs every year, so he's got a lot going on during the football season. Uh, but first thing I wanted to ask you is take me back to Alex's recruitment. And you you were close with Matt Brown, the Texas staff. Kind of talk to me about that before we get into JT Sanders, um, obviously Anthony Hill, Austin Jordan. But kind of take me back to that with Texas. You've watched Texas through the years and get into kind of your thoughts on Steve Sarkeesian so far. Well, you know, just – just for uh, for me personally with Alex, you know, I, I kind of had a connection with uh, Coach Chiswick being here. Chiswick was my defensive coordinator when I played at Stephen F. Austin. And so it kind of started this, you know, um, we always grew up watching Texas. My dad was a huge Longhorn fan. He loved Earl Campbell. And Alan Lowry was a former Irving Tiger. And so, you know, he, he – uh, and Bill Rutherford. So those guys kind of set the motion. Then you had a guy like Norman Watkins, who was another yeah. Irving High guy, ended up going to Texas. I wasn't good enough to go to Texas. I had to go to Stephen F. Austin, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but I but I still got to play on Sunday. But um, my uh, in terms of Alex and his recruitment, that whole, you know, the Chiz train kind of started going. And um, I met Mac in, I believe it was, 2006 at like a coaches association and then it kind of just started from there because I was actually coaching at Stephen F at that time and uh, Mac really was aware of I think Alex in uh, 09 and that's when I first took a job at uh, Denton Ryan when I left Stephen F Austin coaching and went over there and so it just you know it kind of helped that Eric Loki had Derek uh, played there and both Eric and I were dear friends. And, um, you know, uh, Derek was also a Denton Ryan uh, football player. And it, it just kind of had some segue into uh, that whole relationship and recruitment and just relying upon, uh, hey, do you think this guy can play here or whatnot? And so um, when the opportunity presented itself, you know, we brought Alex down to camp. Uh, Will uh, must champ champ came up to me at the very beginning of the camp and said, "Alex is going to be a midterm guy." And I was like, "Yeah, I knew right then that they were pretty much going to offer." And and so that that kind of so and and when he had an opportunity to commit, um, you know, it was like a no brainer for him. So it was really a, a joy and like a dream come true for our whole family and for obviously Alex to to do that. And just to enjoy, they they had some dark times during that time frame for you know Texas football, and I like to think that Alex was a bright spot on that, being you know all Big Twelve a couple of years in that, and um, he really represented himself well during his time there. Coach, I, I got to ask you. We were just talking about this before you came on. 
Yeah. You're you've been coaching what 30 years now, 25 years? 20 a little over 20. Friday okay. 20. Have the kids changed in your opinion from when you started to where you are now? Or is that no. just a fallacy? Is that just a fallacy that all old men like ourselves fall into? No, <laughs> kids are the same. Uh parents uh how how people respond to things are different. Uh I think uh, there's a little more sensitivity, but like in all things in, in coaching kids, you got to know who you're coaching, know your audience. Um, Jimmy, what they used to ask Jimmy Johnson, do you have favorites? And he would say, obviously, yeah, I, I'm a little skewed as well. <laughs> but uh, I, I like to think that everybody has, you, you know, you have a foundation as a coach, but uh, you, you got to stay attuned to what kids are doing. You and up to date and, um, be be a part of the new times because if not you get left behind you know you, from 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 language to to music to really really uh being able to uh roast one another because the kids <laughs> like having fun talking about each other so you got to be able to give it back you know and i like to think i'm the heavyweight champ of the world of that oh you are you are i've heard it before <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no coach that's interesting because i've heard uh that nick Saban's is into the d's nuts jokes so when oh I heard that, gosh, I was like, yeah, yeah you, <laughs> you gotta gotta roll with the times there. Hey, coach, I'm gonna ask you this. Nick Saban sure. also talked about how tough it was to get guys, great athletes that want to play defense. Talked about how Trevon Diggs, who's not an all pro, cried when he, you know, made moved into defense. Uh, but Nick Saban, the greatest defensive mind of all time in college football, thought, hey man, go be a great corner instead of a wide receiver. Are you finding that is the case that great athletes at the high school level? are reluctant to play defense. They all want to play offense, score touchdowns, score points, that kind of thing. Well, I think, you know, like for us, we present a unique situation at Ryan. Uh, we we play our best players both ways. So we, we let them know early on that uh, if you're good enough, if you're athletic enough, if you're competent, like if you have that football acumen that uh, presents itself not only in, on the field, but in the, uh, in the film room, uh, you, you have to be able to have, you have to be on a whole nother level to be those kind of guys. We, uh, believe it or not, consecutively had like uh, three guys that were able to do that for us that are, you know, well known in the sports world and, and being uh, Drew Sanders, who played for me. I played defensive end and receiver. Our best players always play D line and receiver, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> Drew played defensive end and played receiver um, and uh, other things. And then we had Billy Bowman who played receiver and DB. And we had uh, Jatavian who played defensive end and receiver. Those three were as special football players as I've ever coached. Hey, so, Coach, that led me into the question because a lot of Texas fans, they're asking in the chat about JT Sanders. Um, what did you see from JT early on? Um, are you surprised at all? by what you saw from him at Texas headed into the NFL draft. And a little bit about him. What makes him tick for the Texas fans? Because they know the JT they see on Saturdays. Yeah, I I, I would say JT, when I first came back to Ryan, was his sophomore year. Um, he was a skinny. He I, I think JT weighed 200 pounds even and was playing defensive end and receiver. He was an elite level receiver, could go catch the ball. Uh, and, and pull the ball down from anyone and everywhere, had no idea how to play defensive line, at, at least not to my standards, and uh, had to learn how to do that. Uh, and in my mind, it usually takes a defensive lineman about a year to really get ingrained as to what you want them to do. I'm a big fundamental guy. Uh, people always ask me when I played in the NFL, what did you learn? What did you learn? What were some of the things? The best players are the players that are the best fundamentally. Uh, because everybody at that level is big, fast, and strong, right? Um, so the the more sound you are, the better you are to overcome some of the fallacies you will have as a player when when you don't do those things right. And Rob, you you could attest to that as a player. You know that that you have to have those attributes. And what I try to do is, as a coach, not only see those things but harness uh, the uniqueness of each player. And I, I really practice on um, teaching our kids to you, you got to have the capacity for boredom to play defensive line because we're going to step and replace, step and replace, mm -hmm. shoot our hands, shoot our hands. We're going to it's eyes, hands, hips and feet. We're going to do all those things over and over. You're going to play a base reach, a cutoff, a block back pull. You're going to do it a billion times. 
And that way, when you see it, it's in your toolbox. You know how to go do it. JT had never done that before or had never been taught how to play from that mm -hmm. technical standpoint on the defensive line. At receiver, you go throw him the ball, he's <laughs> catching the ball, he's catching the ball with one hand, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um I still thought that he could have been an elite level pass rusher. And so my ego said, hey, he could be <laughs> DN. My heart knew that he wanted to go play receiver just because he knew what he could do out there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you know when you look at his career at Texas, it's uh it's defined by his ability to go make plays. I've never seen or coached anyone that's as big time a football player as JT. When you turn the lights on, he's going to go make the play. And um, and he loves it, and he likes to talk a little crap about it. And and I, I think there's there's some good when you can back it up, and when you can't, you need to shut up. So um, <laughs> he's always he's always been a guy for me. Jatavian's like a son to me, and um, – you know, he's really special in regards to our relationship. I'm, I, I feel like that with all the kids that I coach. Uh, we had some extreme talent on those teams, and uh, he was one of them. I got to ask you about another guy that's got some talent. Yeah. And, played for, and that's Anthony Hill. Yeah. What do you think about that guy? Because he, he also – he actually played running back and linebacker for you guys, yeah. right? Yeah, the good ones play offense and defense. There you go. Yeah. So, it, and it's <laughs> – it's the same way. I, so I've known Anthony and his family since he was seven years old in Irving. Uh, we, when I was the head coach at Irving High, Anthony was coach playing down in the River Bottoms where uh, I played. Uh, anyone that is from Irving and played football in Irving played at the River Bottoms, from Norman Watkins, from Mike Huff, all, all those guys played at the River Bottoms. And, um, and Ant played on those teams, and he played with my youngest son, Colt, and I, and I was coaching. I knew when he was seven years old that that guy was going to be who, you know, who he is. There was only one other kid that I have said that about, and that was uh, Trevor Story, and he starts at shortstop for the Red Sox. Wow. Anthony, Anthony is by far – I've been really blessed to be around a lot of good, talented players. Um, you know, I, I there's a lot of times coaches try to – put their spin on things and, and try to, you know, say, I did this, I did that for them. You know, all I've tried to do is be honest with them and just love them. Tell them no is probably the biggest thing uh, because everybody around them usually is telling them what they want to hear. And I'm not that kind of guy. Um, and, and I've done that with all the kids that I've coached and Anthony is just at the tip of, he, he, he is not even at the tip of uh, the beginning of his career uh, because I believe last year was just a glimpse of some of the things that he's going to do. I feel like he's an elite level pass rusher just now. You got it. You, got it. you there's, there's as a coach, you don't want to have to, you want to take advantage of what an offensive lineman gives you. If you're rushing, like I teach high hat, low hat hands, things like that. You, you have to do these within two seconds. Cause the quarterback's getting the ball in and out of his hands within that time frame. used to be three, on all our old school play action bull crap, but now it's all RPO world. So they're, they're touching and going, but um, Ant has a real uh, uh, innate ability to transition from high hat, low hat, being able to uh, decipher leverage on linemen when he is rushing. And that doesn't take anything from what he, his knack is, what his greatest knack is, is uh, just his ability to get to the football. He's a football player. And, and that's what linebackers do. Hey, if hey, you're coach. If, yeah, if you're having to coach him up a lot at linebacker, you probably don't need to be playing linebacker. It's a great point. Go ahead, Rod. Hey, Coach, I would ask, ask you one question. It's football related, so I don't want to pick yeah. your brain too much. But uh, you were just talking about the RPOs. When I got a, a defensive coach, I always ask him this. What's your? Do you have a golden rule of defending the RPO? Man, it's, it's really cat defense. You put this cat on that cat, and you try to make sure that you take the RPO away. No matter what, an offense is uh, is going to find a way. You can't stop a guy like Sark, uh, Dave Hennigan, our head coach over here at Denton Ryan. You know, those guys are geniuses when it comes to schematics yeah. and defense. For us, it's to line them up. It's to muddy the water. Probably the I think the best thing we do is uh, we try to give uh, static looks all the time and move late or move – early or move back to so as much as a, as an offense is moving the defense gets the same if they're moving i tell our guys we get to move too so yep. let, I, I i always want to change the presentation i don't ever want them to see that they have uh a beat 
And if if we can do something, um, that that's what I try to do, uh, just just so that we can convolute the waters, you know, because yep. there, there's no fun being a defensive coordinator anymore, really. <laughs> other than other than you win, right? <laughs> the rules are made but, uh, for offense. There's no doubt. I agree. It's That's tough nice. and tough. Every time I talk to anyone that has some skins on the wall defensively, I feel dumb because I'm like, shit, I don't, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> I, I'm joking. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's fun to me. You got to continue to stay innovative. And um, yeah. if not, you can, you can get, you can get uh, pegged. And that's the main thing defensively for me at Ryan, we try not to get pegged. We try to pr give different presentation and we try to be multiple in what we do with our looks or stay looking the same way because they think we're, you know, we're not doing nothing than we obviously are. Yeah. Like hey, that. Coach, I didn't have to put you on the spot for this one. We have a super chat that's putting you on the spot for this one. Sure. You guys had some great players come out of Ryan. Give us the top three Ooh. you coached. Ooh, I didn't Ooh, wow. have to put you on the spot. Somebody wow. else did. Well, I, I'm going to – I would be remiss if I didn't say my son first, uh, both <laughs> of them. So I'll put them I'll put them in the same, Alex and Colt. Um, man, you know, there's some guys you just don't even – you don't even know. Um, wow. I mean, it's Where, where it's does just, Mario Edwards fall? Mar Mario Edwards Jr. is at, he's at the top. I he's mean, at the I, top. He's a freak, he, super freak. Mario Edwards Jr. is still playing in the NFL. So yeah. you, mm -hmm. if you want to if you want to pick out peck in order, we can work backwards. He would be <laughs> definitely there. Um, you know, JT and Drew are definitely in it, and I and 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 Anthony Hill and uh, those guys are in Bowman. I mean, good gosh, uh, Bear Alexander. You know, he he's Ooh. at SC. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, but I have I have more guys. This is what people won't realize. We have more guys that you'll never unbelievable high school football players right. that are that are Ryan Raider community kids, like yeah. a kid like Cameron Bowen, a defensive lineman, uh, uh, Damon Metcalf, uh, Johnny Paramore, who was a, a, a star and probably ran a five one, but he was the valedictorian of our uh, school. The guy had nine picks as a senior. And he took six of them back to the house. I called him the rattler because if you threw the ball at him, he was going to strike your ass. And he, and he was that kind of guy. We called him the rattler for real. That's crazy. You know, there there's just all those guys that you you, you I mean, you, I could go on and on defensively with people that we've had um, uh, that that have played at Ryan, and and it obviously started with uh, you know David Thomas, our defensive coordinator. Uh, who was the main guy, the the matriarch of all the defense back then? And uh, Shane Tollerson came in and and uh, obviously followed that up with him. And I'm just trying to continue the momentum as being the next guy. You know, every defense coordinator has won a, a state championship. I, I got to get it done. There, there. Hey, last thing, coach, before we let you go, and we appreciate your time so much. Yeah. Your yeah. thoughts on Steve Sarkeesian? I'm sure you've been down there. Uh, been close enough, but you, even if it's from a distance, your thoughts on Steve Sarkeesian, what he's doing at Texas, kind of the future of Texas football moving to the SEC with Sark. Well, I, I'm going to say this first. Uh, I did not know Sark coming in. And uh, the first day he got the job, the first school he was at was at Denton Ryan. Because if you remember when he wow. took over from Herm, uh, JT was still committed to him and was yep. a five-star guy. And Sark walks in and is like, I was told I need to get to know you. And I'm like, well, good. I was, same thing. And, uh, you know, I absolutely love Sark. He's been nothing but respectful to to us and uh, Coach Hennigan. The way high school coaches should act, uh, should, should, should emulate the way that uh, it, the relationship with college coaches should be the way that he does with us. And I would think he does this with everyone. Um, a lot of only – talk to you when they need something from you. Right. You know, those, those guys are a, a phone call. I, I can call him on immediately and he's going to get back to me. Any, any time that I have sent him something, he has responded. Um, he has always been very cordial. So take all that professionalism and, and tie that to the field. I think what he's done with the players there has shown he has created a professionalism in the, in the building to where he's telling these kids, you're not just coming here to, you're coming here to play football, be the best you can be, get a degree, 
But if you're here to be a football player, go play in the NFL too. And I think that's changed the tide as to what you see some of the players that are coming through there. Um, no more, um, I got to play as a freshman. Hey, man, just play when you play and good things will happen for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I've just seen how it translates with the recruiting. I feel like those guys, when they walk in the room, they do a really good job of uh, with the people that represent Texas and I'm not saying that any other group hadn't done that. I think Sark being someone from the outside, outside of Texas, really not having a lot of Texas ties in my mind, uh, like like other guys might have had, um, he he put the right people in place to go in there and do some of that. And, um, and that's probably the most important thing is strategically hiring all the coaches that he's hired and then being able to get into the high schools like he has and I, just cherry picking the portal. Uh, I, I think those guys, the you know, if they can continue the momentum that, that you know, just good things are going to continue to happen for Texas. All right, so. Coach. Very Thank you very much for joining us on uh, yeah, man. Sunday. We, we can look forward to another conversation uh, with you in the future, man, and I'll be up to see you guys this spring. Let's do it. We start April 22nd. There you go. Hey, you huh? just said that you may have a thousand Longhorn fans show up. <laughs> hey, well, we've had we've had three of them in the last few years repping that orange and white. You know, come on out. We'll we'll have more. All right. Exactly. Thank you very much, Coach. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Coach. Take care. Take care. Hook. Take care. All right, that's Aaron, Coach Jane Delatory, defensive coordinator at Denton Ryan. Obviously, his son Alex Delatory played at Texas. He coached JT Sanders. Uh, Anthony Hill. We didn't even get to Austin Jordan, Billy Bowman, all those power five guys uh, that came out of Denton Ryan. They have Ty Haywood in this class as an offensive lineman and some young uh, defensive guys that are up and coming in 26 and 27. So thank you very much uh, to Coach uh, DLT, as I call him, for uh, joining in Longhorn live stream. Uh, Bobby, tell take every, take a second, tell everybody about Joe Brown, the sponsor of the Sunday Night Longhorn live stream. Yeah, I really appreciate Joe. I've known Joe for 25 plus years. When I bought my first home, he was actually my mortgage broker. So when you go to make a financial decision, one of the biggest in your life, like a mortgage, uh, you're going to want somebody that you can trust and has decades of experience. That is Joe Brown. Uh, he has been doing this for 30 plus years now. He's also a Navy veteran and has a diff two different degrees uh, from the University of Texas. He's done mortgages throughout the uh, city of Austin, of course, but also across the state. So if you're interested in talking about how you can get a mortgage for your next home, give him a call, 512-663-4744. That's 512-663-4744. Uh, Joe Brown, your veteran mortgage professional. We appreciate you, Joe. All right, let's take a second to reset the show real quick. We've been talking spring football here. I've got to get to a little recruiting talk. We're about to get to Josiah Sharma update, uh, the four-star defensive lineman from Folsom High out in Northern California, a little east of Sacramento. Uh, guys uh, that don't know, Josiah Sharma, jo Johnny Nansen, when he was hired at Texas, went up and uh, he's going to be a huge hire in California. Remember, Bobby and I have been talking about this. Sark has that SoCal footprint. Johnny Nansen added to that whole California footprint, the West Coast footprint. I think that was a huge hire. Uh, Josiah Sharma was offered uh, by Johnny Nansen in late January. Uh, Friday, him and his mom were on campus for their first ever visit to Texas. Now, he lived in the Arlington area for a few years when he was younger, then moved to the state of California. He played at Endercrum High. Uh, in Sacramento before transferring over to Folsom. So he'll play a senior at Folsom. Six, three and a half, 323 pounds on his visits uh, this last week. He went to Alabama. He's a former Washington commitment. He went to Alabama. He went to Oklahoma. Then he ended at Texas. That was during Folsom spring break. But the returns I've heard were tremendous. Spoke with somebody close, very close to that recruitment today. There were also a few Folsom coaches uh, on campus for Friday's spring practice for Texas. But I think Texas battling it out right there with Alabama for Josiah Sharma, one of the top D tackles in the country. Rankings be damned. They'll they'll correct themselves over time. You just turn on the tape of Josiah Sharma and you learn a little bit about him. When you talk to the Folsom staff, they said the most – and they played against him at Endercrum. They said the most impressive thing was the motor. So after you watch the film and after you see the frame, if that's the most impressive thing – 
that Folsom saw playing against him, that's saying something for his talent level. So things are uh, going well with Josiah Sharma. He'll be back for an official visit, likely June 14th through 16th, which means he'll bump that Utah visit. Uh, but again, former Washington commitment uh, that will, Alabama has recruited, Kalen DeBoer has recruited since taking the job at Alabama. That tells you how uh, good uh, DeBoer thinks this kid can be because there's a lot of talented defensive linemen from Louisiana, Florida, up to Carolinas. And the fact that Washington, uh, DeBoer left Washington, went to Bama, and went back to Folsom High to recruit uh, Josiah Sharma just tells you how good he is. Texas is in a pretty good spot there. We'll see how things work out. But a very good visit. Kobe Sellers, the four-star from uh, Shadow Creek, was a thunder pump. Hello from Folsom. There you go. Kobe Sellers, the four-star corner out of Shadow Creek, was also on campus Friday for an official visit. Uh, 5'11 and a half, 175 pounds. He went to A&M, obviously, this weekend as well. Kobe Sellers' visit was interesting because he actually got to the facility. He told me that shortly after 6 a.m., um, and, and that was to take in the entire day. That means the nutrition program. That means sitting in on the players, the position meeting before practice, taking in the practice prep, then taking in the practice. That is a tremendous look by Kobe Sellers and his family at Texas more than just showing up 30 minutes before spring practice, right? You got to look at everything. And then uh, some other news, recruiting news. C.J. Vogel caught up with DeCorian Moore, five-star everything receiver out of Duncanville, currently an LSU commit. He'll be on campus April 6th this weekend, which is going to be a huge visit weekend. We're going to preview this all week. Um, he'll be on campus April 6th and then April 20th. So two visits in April plus a June official visit coming for Texas with DeCorian Moore. So things are going to heat up there. Ohio State and Oregon are going to be mentioned. But this is really Texas and LSU going head-to-head, -head, uh, really going to battle out here. And I, I think Texas has some things in their favor with DeCorian Moore, but this, this recruitment still has to play out. So those are three of the guys, a lot going on. 2026 safety out of Baton Rouge. Uh, Blaine uh, Bradford, one of the top 2026 safeties in the country, he told me this afternoon he's going to visit April 13th. So that's going to be a big 2026 weekend. That's when – your John Turntines, some of those guys are going to visit in that 26 class. So Blaine Bradford, DB out of Baton Rouge, who Terry Joseph offered earlier, uh, I believe late in 23, actually, he's going to make an unofficial visit April 13th as well. Uh, so Bobby, a lot going on. Uh, we're going to get to the super chat. Justin Yarborough, Bobby thinks Sark is chasing more than a top five class of recruiting. Jerry, what's going on uh, to take Sark for, for, for Sark to make that happen? I, let me start with this, and I, I know what he's talking about. I look, I don't think Sark is going to be. I, I'm not saying he's he won't accept a top five recruiting class or a top ten or whatever it is. I think his, um, and I want to say this the right way. I think his uh, his his tenor and and his way of it now is changing. He knows he can get a top three class at Texas. He's seen it. So now he's expecting it. Uh, you you mentioned this, Jerry. Plus, with the addition of going to the SEC, the national football playoff or the college football playoff that he just had, the fact that he's getting ready to have eight to ten guys drafted in the NFL draft, he's in, in fact he is a very good recruiter himself and prides himself on that. I think that you're going to see him recalibrate really what his expectations are. Uh, from a recruiting standpoint. And he's been at two places, Jerry, frankly, where, I mean, when his, when he was an assistant at USC under Pete Carroll, they had number one ranked re recruiting classes, I think, three years in a row. Well, when he was at Alabama under Nick Saban, I think he had number one recruiting classes two years in a row. And so my point being, I'm not saying he's going to end up with number one class. I don't know that, right? I mean, that's, you, you, you'll have to get into it and see who falls your way, et cetera. But the reality of it is I do think he's chasing more than just a quote unquote top five class these days. He's, he's, he's chasing big time players and he's going to try to, I mean, if it's not number one, maybe it's number two or number three, whoever or yeah. where. And that's all going to come down to how many guys you sign at the end of the day, because I'm about to get Rod's thoughts on something very important in recruiting. Um, uh, because he went through it uh, when Matt got to Texas. But uh, so here's the thing. Georgia, what, signed 29 guys last year? I don't know. You know, you're going to have to hit that 
Texas number three class in 23, I believe, had 28 signees, right? Last year was 22 after DeAndre Robinson Field, after Bo Davis went to LSU. So I, I don't know if Texas is going to approach that because there's a lot of different ways that it, it, what people in the industry calculate a ranking. Sometimes it's your top 19 recruits. Sometimes it's all your recruits. There's just different ways to look at it. I'm not sure we're going to see Texas sign a 28, 29 man class. Could it get to 25, 26? That's certainly possible. So that goes a long way in reaching that number one or two class, mm -hmm. unless you just sign a class of 20 guys with seven, five stars, which probably isn't happening. Uh, so, Rod, I wanted to ask you a question about recruiting. And I, we talk about this briefly, but I wanted you to expound on this. You were part of the number one class in the country. Yep. And, I, and Matt, first year, first full class. Ricky went and won the Heisman. I know times are different now. All the kids have the group chats and whatnot, but I know Brew got y'all on the phone. What yeah, were yeah. the conversations like? Where Pete, even Jerome Sapp, who your boy who picked Notre Dame, he was he mm -hmm. was on that official visit to Texas. What were the conversations like? Did y'all have a feeling Texas was about to do something special? I mean, Corey Redding, Sims, all you guys, was there a feeling there? Or did y'all just kind of bond together and say, this Matt Brown guy's the best up guy I've ever talked to, and I I put my trust in him. Yeah, it was it was a little bit of both, because you know it, you had that Heisman season with Ricky. I think that tech that made Texas, you know, more of the it program once again. And Ricky was cool, man, and cool is currency in recruiting. Say what you want, but it is. I remember talking to some of the guys about what they like about Sark. You know, one of the first three things they mentioned talking about Sark, his shoes. They yep. all love his shoes. Great point. His shoes are all cool. Did you see cool him at shoes. Coda? You see him with the Louis Vuitton shoes? I mean, I know a lot of that is wifey. Wifey does a great job, all right, making sure that he's, you know, dressed in, dressed to the nines. Uh, she's a fashionista. But uh, cool is currency. And back then, Ricky Williams was really cool. He still is really cool, by the way. But he was really cool back then. I think that brought eyes to Texas, making Texas cool again. And then you had... Tim Brewster, who was a, an ace recruiter, who was, I mean, he he was able to get for some, and I would say I'm, I'm good friends with Chris Sims and Bo Scaife and, you know, my man Montreal Flowers and Kyle Shanahan to this day. The nucleus, that, nucleus of that group is me, Shano, and Bo Scaife, and we got Tim Brewster to thank for that. Tim Brewster started that friendship before we even signed our scholarships. Because he would like put us on like conference calls together and, and three way and be like, hey, hey, Robbie, I'm talking to Sims right now on the other side. Hold on, hold on. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get y'all on the phone together. G give me a second. Give me a second. Let me call you back. And he would. And to, it was, I don't even know if there was a violation or what, but it was brilliant. <laughs> because we were, he, he knew back then, even today, the best, your best recruiters are who? They're players. Yeah. The players, they recruit each other. And we even started recruiting each other to a certain extent, right? And talking about where we're going and all that kind of stuff, and now, like you said, it's really different. Um, but so I think it was a com it was a combination. It was a confluence of a lot of. And Mac Brown was a hell of a recruiter. And Mac, listen, Mac Brown, Mac Brown knew cool was currency too. Mac Brown told us when we got on campus, he kept telling recruiting class after recruiting class, "We're going to Nike, guys. Don't worry about this Reebok stuff." Because he knew that some players were so yep. superficial that that mattered. Like, oh, man, a Reebok. I'm not playing a Reebok. Nike's cool because cool is currency. At, you see what Dion is doing? Whether you like it or not, he's re he's there, he's able to recruit because he's cool. He, he yep. ain't even, he's doing, he's doing not even taking trips. He's not even going on visits to people, high schools, and to their homes. He's just staying in Colorado because he's cool. And everybody wants to come see him because he's cool, man. Cool is still currency. And that's why Sark in the shoes, it does matter. Those details matter. That's why Mac Brown saying, we're going to Nike. And I think it took him like a year or two. My toenails fell off wearing Reebok cleats uh, that first year. Well, so he, he knew, he knew yeah. that it mattered. That's what, so that, I think, I think Sark knows all that stuff, the, the, the image and the brand, it all matters. And by the way, the celebrity quarterback, once Sims comes on board, yeah. it's like getting your Arch Manning on board. You got your, your celebrity QB. And then, then to the nation, Texas becomes cool again it cool. almost feels cool. like it's going through it again in a really yeah. weird yeah, way you're right. and, and by the way somebody mentioned Oregon yes Oregon has had cool feeling the Nike at Nike oh, yeah. campus not far from Oregon up in Portland for Eugene I mean absolutely that cool school appeal is so Tim Tebow made Florida a cool school same time they won a couple of national championships at basketball after Rod and Chris and all those guys I'm telling you 
I lived in Houston at the time when Vince and TJ went to Texas and back. Rod, you're from Houston. When those guys went to Texas back-to-back years, Texas went to the stratosphere of cool schools in the state of Texas. So all that stuff matters. Hey, by the way, uh, we have a lot of people joining us on the Twitter feed. Like, subscribe, come subscribe to On Texas Football. Like uh, uh, everything you see, please. And thank you very much for joining in with us. We have coffee and football in the morning, five days a week, a bunch of shows. Uh, we have uh, the winning drive on, on Tuesday and Thursday with Rod B and CJ Vogel and Coach Bob Shipley. A lot of stuff over here for you guys. Uh, we have a, a super chat from Football Junkie. Bobby, can you speak to it's in how the defensive line has been holding up during the live periods. Who is standing out in that room? Yeah, I, I've got very little right now on that, to be honest with you. Um, and the reason I, I, I have not, they did, they did probably their biggest hard work on Friday of this last week. Uh, Alfred Collins was, was mentioned as a guy. I know they love where Trey Moore is right now yeah. from a, not just from a getting after the quarterback guys, but also how he's holding up in the run game. Yeah. Um, which is important because he's not the biggest guy on out there. Uh, but they like how he's holding up in the run game. Baron Sorrell, obviously. And then also I'd mention again, I, I've heard some positive things about uh, a number of players, but Alfred Collins on the interior, Aaron Bryant and my, and uh, Alex January uh, also on the interior as well. Yeah, I heard early on that Savea, I think uh, Anchorin, yep. is 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 doing very well. Uh, I think Colin Simmons has been disruptive without being uh, assignment sound, as you would expect from a guy that's been that through six practices now. But that ability to be a disruptor off the edge with that explosive first and second step quickness uh, has shown up at times already as well. Uh, you look at – somebody asked about Colton Vosick. Um, you know, look, uh, Colton Vosick – is uh, a guy that's just battled health for the last year since he's been on campus. And he was making some strides. He was mentioned early on before he sat, hit that injury bug as a guy that could force his way into the rotation a little bit, right? So uh, get him staying out healthy, staying out there healthy for the entire spring is, is going to be big for his development and his ability to kind of push through. Uh, Baron Sorrell, Ethan Burke, all those guys. We've heard a lot of positive things right now. Obviously, it's spring football, practice six. Uh, nine to go spring game April 20th so uh, again uh, thank you very much to everybody who's joining in tonight not just the guy the guys on Twitter that are jumping in but everybody that joins us we went over 40,000 we're over 40,100 now I always I can't thank you guys enough for being part of the community being part we're all on the on Texas football team here man I, I thank Amen. everybody um, Cameron Miller hypothetically if you Quinn Ewers got hurt and Arch starts the rest of the season. What happens after the season to both? Uh, I had to bring I had to bring this question in. I know what what is going on. Let why why do we have to worry? Why why can't we just enjoy both? You know, Hard more problems. You can like chocolate and vanilla. You know, you don't have to just like one or the other. <laughs> oh, look, look here's the happy way. Cameron. Don't don't go break into. My dad told me this a long time ago. Son, don't ever break into jail. <laughs> goes, that's a good one. Man. That's a good one. That's a great. I love that one. Don't so ever. Here, I'm going to answer part of this. This is Quinn's last season at Texas. Hey, if you look yeah. at the 2025 NFL draft at quarterback, Rod, we had a question Friday on this, um, or early, maybe on coffee and football. That this Quinn's decision to come back, one, I think he needed to, right? I, I think mm-hmm. people around him knew he needed to get stronger. Need to be that third. You get over that 25 start uh, number since he had been hurt off and on the last two years. But the 2025 quarterback draft, it's wide open. Like last year this time, Rod, there was already talk of uh, of Williams, Caleb Williams going number one, a returning Heisman Trophy winner playing at Lincoln yeah. for Lincoln Rally at USC. I mean, people were already saying, no, he's going to be number one pick. This thing's over. Uh, then Drake May was being mentioned as a guy. Maybe he could push him, but so there were two guys being mentioned already. This year with the 25 class, it's wide open. Wide open. Wide yeah. open. It's yeah. a great decision to stay. One, he needed to, but two, it does give a quarterback, Quinn or the guy, whether it's Carson Beck, maybe it's Riley Leonard at Notre Dame. Who knows? Somebody this guy has a chance to make a massive jump this year. Yeah, Brady and- Cook it. Brady Cook at uh, Missouri, really good athlete. Under yeah, he's good. 
That's a good point. No, I man, Shadur, I'm not saying Shadur's going to be the number one, but the top quarterback taken, you know, he's, he's in that conversation. Dion says he's going to be the top quarterback taken. So, I mean, no, yeah, Dion, yeah. not his opinion. But, no, you're right about that. I think it, it, it is wide open who's going to be the top quarterback taken. It could be Quinn. Quinn's not that kind of stuff. If he takes another leap, like he is similar to what he took last season, I could definitely see Quinn in that conversation. And, yeah, he, of course he made the right decision to come back. He hasn't played an entire football season, guys. That's right. And what? Since he was sophomore year of sophomore high school, year high school. school, sophomore year of high school. First, that's the first. That's why that question. Although I love, I love what Bobby said. Don't, don't break into jail. It is, you know, relevant because, you know, what I mean. The last, I want to say, since nineteen ninety nine, there's only been like seven seasons where a Texas quarterback has started and finished every game uh, of the entire season. And Quinn hasn't done it since his sophomore year. So there is a very realistic possibility. That it happens. This I'm knocking on wood because I want Quinn to play every damn game, um, and I, and that's also something that those scouts want to see too. Before they spend a one one on you or make you the top quarterback in the draft, they want to see like can he make it through? They got 17 games, guys, and they're going to 18 in the NFL. All right, they're they're, they're playing more quarterbacks than they ever have in the NFL right now. Um, in terms of teams playing their second string and using their third string quarterbacks the last two years. And a lot of it has to do with 18, 17 games. They're going to 18. Durability of the quarterback, it, it matters. Hey, uh, hook them question. Running back room getting stronger question mark. I, I, I stick, I'm sticking my neck out there, and I have done this a little bit already. I think per capita, it's the strongest position on the team. Oh, yeah, yeah, Rod. Look. I heard Senator Baxter tore it up Friday now and that's it, 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 in practice. But you add in Senator Baxter in year two, Jaden Blue year three, Trey Wisner year two, but those freshmen. I mean, Christian Clark, Jarrett Gibson, and then you have Savion Red there as well. I think in the 40 acres, they feel like four or five guys are going to be pros out of that room. So if you're telling me you have six guys in the room and four or five are going to be pros one day, that's per capita the strongest room in the program right now. I think every scholarship quarterback at Texas right now is going to be in the NFL, though. And that Trey Owens look good, don't he? Don't Trey Owens look good? Doesn't he look good? I'm telling you. I, I no. when Jerry when Jerry told me to watch Trey Owens, I said this. I said, man, I like this kid. He looks good. He ain't necessarily got the you know the five star rating and the big name of a Arch or a Quinn. But man, you go just go watch him throw. Just go watch him throw for a while, and you'll see you'll see what Sark sees. There ain't no I, doubt. I'll tell you what it is. He's not as athletic as you want. Like he's not ideally athletic, but it's clunky. It's clunky. Rod, Rod, yeah. he can make he he's got a huge arm. I mean, he's yeah. just huge. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I think I I me and Jerry go back and forth on this one. I think the offensive line could be there too. Yeah. Uh, and I also think. Defensive end is getting that way right now. So. Can I? Uh, I'll say this about Jerry's point though, because it's hard to argue with what Jerry said. Yep. There's something special about. I've said every position room at Texas should strive to be what that running back room is now. It, it, they whether it was hell even before Tashard Choice got that he's outstanding. Tish, hell, Stan Drayton was great in that room. Hell, even before it was Bijan and Rojo. Hell, Rojo was taking uh, the spot of uh, what's his name? I can't think of right now. Went to USC, drafted into the NFL. Uh, Keontae, Keontae Ingram. Ingram. Keontae Thank Ingram. you very much. Sorry, my CTE kicks in. <laughs> Keontae Ingram. You know what I mean? And then he took his spot, and then Bijan took Rojo's spot, and then Cedric Baxter won the job, and Jay Brooks ended up being the dope walk. I mean, it doesn't matter who ends up getting the front line position. The competition level is so high. The camaraderie is so deep with that group and the coaching is so damn good. They really check all the boxes. So it would be hard for me to argue against what Jerry's saying. Now I, I see what you're saying about QB because that's Sark's baby. So Sark ain't going to never let that room go, you know what I mean? Without a, 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 a ton of talent in it. So that's the, I, I can see where Bobby's coming from, but man, that running back, that, that position room, I'd put up against any position room right now of any team of any program in the country. It's that good. It really is. It has been really good for a while. I, uh, that leads to a question here. Uh, we got a few minutes left on this uh, Longhorn live stream. Uh, thank you again to our sponsor, Joe Brown. Uh, you see up there, a way to get, contact him up in the upper right-hand corner there, 512-663-4744. Uh, again, thank you to all the people joining in tonight. Hit that like and subscribe button. All right, we've, we've, we've had this. I'm not sure the three of us have discussed this, though. Most improved position on the team next year. 
Where are you going with that one, Rod? I've been saying safety because I think it, it the athleticism just took so many steps up. Um, and then with having a transfer in like Makuba. So, but I, where do you go? I mean, do you have a position you're really looking at? Because like last year, um, you know, I, I, I think I went O line last year uh, for most improved, but where do you guys see it? Honestly, it, it should be the secondary, but I'll go honestly, the, the edge this That's year. A good one. You stole Bobby's. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Bobby, because I know I've been on the secondary bandwagon for a while and they should be better. But I've been hearing such great stuff about the guys on the edges. You know, we and we take for granted the Baron Sorrell and, and, yes. and Ethan Burke. Right. We, just, we take for granted that you know, Ethan Burke led the team in, in sacks last season. I think Baron Sorrell, the season before that, we kind of take their development for granted. But I think both of those guys are, you know, kind of bound to take a leap this year. And then you're going to add in Trey Moore, who is a natural pass rusher. And Sark just raves about him already. Sark's already talking about, you know, his his professional mentality and how he goes to work and his work ethic. So I think he's going to be one of those guys that that has an instant impact. And then we talked about a prodigy also being added to the mix. And Colin Simmons, you got a prodigy there. So you know that in certain situations, you're going to be able to put him out there immediately, especially pass rushing situations, and have him, you know, uh, play a huge role for you. I just think you've got so much depth there. I'm going to say in terms of big, I think the secondary will be a strength too, but in terms of the biggest leap, I think it might be the edges because I think this year that may be the group that provides the most pressure and where a lot of your splash plays are coming from off the edge. And I'll add this. If Texas is going to take the next step as a defense, that's where it's got to be because I was looking at sack numbers since 2017 in college football today. Got to get the quarterback to the ground. That's the next big step for the Texas defense. And they're going to be going against more athletic, longer arm offensive tackles in the SEC, Bobby. Amen. Don't forget about two young guys, both the true sophomores or redshirt freshmen. Now, if you want to categorize them, Billy Walton and Colton Vosick at edge two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, to Rod's point, it's not just the addition of Trey Moore and someone like Colin Simmons. It's also that Baron Sorrell's a year older. Ethan Burke's a year older, some of these talented guys. It's the depth that they're yep. creating right now at Edge. They're going to be able to run numbers at you a little bit. And, and why it's so important to have the explosive Edge rush, it kind of goes back, Rod, to the question uh, that you asked Coach De La Torre about RPO game. Yep. Yes. You have to have some explosiveness off the Edge. That's yep. never been more important than it is today. Because that RPO game, people are getting the ball out quicker, right? Mm -hmm. Fast. Yep. And it's on time. And you're right. If you're going to be able to, you got to compress that pocket, make that quarterback feel that pressure. Um, then that throw just a little bit off, time's a little bit off, feels a little bit rushed. Those are the things you, you're operating right in the margins now. Uh, it's, it, it really is a game of inches. You saw Coach Delatore's reaction when I asked him that because defensive coordinators now, man, they are, it's, it's dark. There's an old uh, DMX lyric it's dark and hell is hot. That's how it feels being a DC in the RPO world, man. It is dark, and you're just out there trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, before we get going, uh, Jerry, I want to ask you this question uh, from Paige Grig Grigsby. What do you think the big announcement is of Michael Fasusi tomorrow? That's the big offensive lineman uh, out of Louisville that uh, Texas is in on, Oklahoma. He visited A&M over the weekend. Uh, what are you hearing the very latest is there, Jerry? I don't think he's committing anywhere tomorrow. Um, that's what I'll say. I mean, I could be wrong. I haven't had a lot of time to run it down, but I don't think he's committing tomorrow. He's got official visits set up. Uh, just for all the fans out there, know what tomorrow is. It's April Fool's Day, so uh, be aware <laughs> of that in the old recruiting world tomorrow. Seriously. I'm not going to do anything April Fool's. I guarantee you that as far as the with a, any recruiting stuff, but I'm saying the kids are going to have some fun. Yeah, they will. Good stuff. Jerry, I appreciate it, buddy. Good, good stuff tonight. Yeah, absolutely, guys. And uh, thank you again. Uh, if you if you're just tuning in late, go back and watch. We had Coach De La Torre on from Denton Ryan, D coordinator. He's also ha head coach at Irving um, High, but he coached JT Sanders, uh, Anthony Hill, obviously uh, Austin Jordan, who we didn't get a chance to talk to, Billy Bowman, uh, San Drew Sanders. I mean, you go down Mario Edwards Jr., who to me is still one of the freakier guys. We had him in the Under Armour game and. He was one of the first guys, uh, by the way, guys, he was one of the first guys 
that I saw at like 290 pounds doing standing back flips. And he did it with this big old like turnover chain thing on. And <laughs> we were just like looking around saying, I, I haven't seen many guys like this. And I've been in the business about 15 years at that point. Uh, but Coach De La Torre's to coach some of the best. Uh, Denton Ryan's got some a lot of young talent coming up. All those Denton schools are loaded. Guy and Ryan are loaded. But uh, thank you to our sponsor, Joe Brown, veteran mortgage, mortgage broker, 512-663-4744. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. We'll be back with coffee and football in the morning. Uh, if you joined us on Twitter, and I heard there were thousands, come join us again. Hit that like and subscribe. Get us on notifications. Uh, we're talking here, Texas Longhorn football, spring practice, recruiting, uh, everything you want to know about the Longhorns and recruiting. Hey, SEC fans, join in too. Come talk trash at me. I love it. And by the way, <laughs> congrats to Vic Schaefer on a great run Damn. this year. Elite eight, losing your point guard, an all-American level point guard after 12 games. I counted him out for me in a one seed and make it to the Elite eight. I think a lot of others did too. Uh, his best days are ahead at Texas. Great coach. Tremendous. Amen, Happy Easter, everybody. Seriously, Rod, to you and your family, your first, your daughter's first Easter, Easter as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you, brother. Uh, best of luck to you, buddy. I'll see you tomorrow morning on, on uh, Coffee and Football, guys. Matt, you, our producer, appreciate you as well, and appreciate everybody joining us, whether it's on YouTube, uh, Twitter, wherever you're joining us from today. Again, please hit that like and subscribe button if you don't mind. Hook them. Hook them.